Greetings from the great state of Alaska. My name is Dr. G, and today I want to share with you a message of hope. You know, last week we talked about the faithfulness of God as a divine attribute, faithfulness. We said that only God is always faithful. Sometimes man is faithful, but man's faithfulness is conditional. God is not that way. God's faithfulness is unconditional. You see, God is infinitely faithful. You know, we talked about Abraham and how Abraham experienced God's faithfulness throughout his life. And in that moment, we said that God's faithfulness is something that we experience as we have a relationship with God. It's part of the process. You see, faithfulness isn't a one-time experience. We don't experience the faithfulness of God one time. We don't reach a step or a plateau of God's faithfulness. But every day, every step along the way through life, we experience the faithfulness of God. You know, a lot of folks don't have a relationship with God. And so they go through life without ever really experiencing God's faithfulness. Or what I should say is they go through life without recognizing it or discovering it. It's not that God is unfaithful. It's just they don't recognize God's faithfulness in their life. So let's take a couple of notes here. Faithfulness. We said that God is always faithful. And we said that faithfulness really is something we experience in our relationship with God. It's a process. It's part of the process. And today I want to talk to you about God's faithfulness as it relates to his presence in our lives. So let's just write that down. Now, God's presence, his omnipresence, is also an attribute, a divine attribute. And we talked about um, omnipresence. We talked about that uh, maybe last month. And, and truly, God is om omnipresent. He's everywhere at every time. He's in all places at all times. But today what we're talking about is that God is faithfully present in the life of the believer. In the Bible, God said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. Uh, Jesus said in the New Testament, I will be with you until the end of the world. You see, we're not alone. God will always be present. He's faithfully present. Right now, I want you to think about someone who is very close to you. Someone that you love, someone that is present with you every day. And somebody that inspires you. Maybe this is a spouse. Maybe this is a parent. Maybe this is a best friend. And just think about that for a moment. How would you feel tomorrow morning if you woke up and that person was gone? And they were gone forever. How would you feel? You might feel abandoned. You might feel alone. You might even feel lost. Ultimately, you would be depressed. But you see, God, He is faithful to be with us always. We never have to feel abandoned by God. We never have to feel depressed or alone because God is with us. Amen? You know, we talked about Abraham last week, but this week we are going to transition our, our conversation uh, to Abraham's descendants. We're going to look at the children of Israel, and we're going to look at God's faithfulness to the children of Israel. And we're going to look at God's faithfulness through a deliverer that he raised up, Moses. So we're going to look at both of these uh, aspects of God's faithfulness in the children of Israel. You see, the faithfulness of God was evident in Moses' life from the very beginning. You see, the children of Israel, they, they lived in Egypt. They were enslaved by the Egyptians, and the children of Israel, even though they were enslaved, they were 
prosperous. And when I say prosperous, they were productive. They, were, they grew in numbers, so much so that uh, the Egyptians felt threatened by the uh, growth in population of the Israelites. And so the Egyptians, they, uh, they had no regard for innocent life. And so what they did, they began to kill off the male children of the Israelites. They would kill them as soon as they were born. It was kind of an abortion. And uh, they valued their own prosperity and their own power over innocent life. And unfortunately, we see a similar tragedy unfolding every day in America. Thousands of innocent lives are aborted every day because of selfishness and because of a disregard for innocent life. And, and that's, that's a shame, uh, but it is a fact. You know, I want to turn to the book of Exodus. So if you have your Bibles, if you'd like to turn to Exodus chapter 2, verses 1 through 6, it says, A man of the house of Levi went and took as wife a daughter of Levi. So the woman conceived and bore a son. And when she saw that he was a beautiful child, she hid him for three months. Now, this is talking about baby Moses. But when she could no longer hide him, she took an ark of bulrushes for him, daubed it with asphalt and pitch, and she put the child in it and laid it in the reeds by the river bank. So she basically took her son Moses and she put him in this basket that she had made from just natural elements that were there and she pushed him off into the Nile River. Now, I'm no expert on the Nile River, but I'm pretty sure there's crocodiles in the Nile River and probably some big fish and probably some snakes. It's probably a dangerous place. But this woman had enough faith in God. Perhaps she had a relationship with God and had experienced his faithfulness. She was com comfortable and confident to put Moses in this precarious position. And so Moses kind of floated off down the river. Verse 5, it says, The daughter of Pharaoh came down to bathe at the river, and her maidens walked along the river side. And when she saw the ark among the reeds, she sent her maid to get it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the child wept. So she had compassion on him. And she said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. And so what we see here is that God was with Moses. God was present with Moses. Even before Moses could even have a relationship with God, he was still a baby. God was demonstrating faithfulness to the child. A lot of bad things could have happened, but ultimately Moses was raised in the house of Pharaoh. He was educated, he had a lot of privilege, and ultimately, he, he left the house of Pharaoh. We won't get into that story because it's a long story. But you see, Moses was chosen by God to be the deliverer of God's people, Israel. God appeared to Moses in the Midian desert when Moses seen the burning bush. And so if we go to Exodus, see, I think Exodus chapter 3 is where we want to go. It says... In chapter 3, verse 2, And the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire from the midst of a bush. So he looked, and behold, the bush was burning with fire, but the bush was not consumed. And then Moses said, I will now turn aside and see this great sight, why the bush does not burn. And as we go through this chapter, we see that God reaches out to Moses. God is present with Moses, faithfully present. And God says to him in verse 6, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. 
You see, Moses is having a meeting with God. God is present. And, and Moses is, is a little bit scared. It's a kind of a first time meeting for him. Verse 7. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the oppression of my people who are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry because of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. So I have come down to deliver them out of the hand of the Egyptians and to bring them up from the land to a good and large land, to a land flowing with milk and honey, to the place of the Canaanites. And so what we see here, we, we, we see that God is continually fulfilling his promises to us. And in this passage, we see that God is faithfully fulfilling his promise to Abraham, even though Abraham's been dead for a long time. God is still fulfilling that promise because God is faithful. It says, Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come to me, and I have also seen the oppression with which the Egyptians oppress them. Now come, and I will send you to Pharaoh, that you may bring my people, the children of Israel, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, <laughs> See, Moses, like his father Abraham, Moses is having a little bit of doubt. I was like, wait a minute, whoa, wait a second, God, we've just met. And you're, you have this plan that seems like an impossible plan. Remember, that's what happened with Abraham. God made Abraham a promise and gave him some direction. And Abraham had a little doubt and didn't know how God was going to make good on this promise. And here we see God is, once again, uh, giving a, a tall order to Moses. And Moses is having a little bit of doubt. Moses said to God, Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the children of Israel? out of Egypt. And so God replies in verse 12, I will certainly be with you. I will certainly be with you. And this shall be a sign to you that I have sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall serve God on this mountain. Now I want to highlight the first part of verse 12. I will certainly be with you. And we need to write that down. I will certainly be with you. You know, today you might be able to relate to Moses. God may be setting you up for an, what seems to you an impossible task. And you might say, God, but God, how? And what you have to understand is that with God all things are possible. Remember uh, what God said to Abraham, is anything too hard for the Lord? And remember what Jesus said to Mary when Lazarus was raised from the dead. Jesus said, if you would believe, you would see the glory of the Lord. And here we see God saying to Moses, I will certainly be with you. And when God is with you, that makes a big difference in your life when God is with you. Uh, look at little David when he went out on the battlefield against Goliath, the Philistine. Once again, that was kind of an impossible looking situation. But David wasn't alone. God was with David. And just like God was with Moses. Now we're going to continue to look at this story in the book, book of Exodus. You know, we need to understand that for us to once again recognize and experience the faithfulness of God, we need to really be in relationship with God. So we need to write that down again in case you're, somebody's missing that relationship. When you have a good relationship with God, you have a good experience in terms of God's faithfulness. It doesn't mean you won't go through periods of doubt, because certainly these great men in the Old Testament, these patriarchs, they had their doubts just like we do. But they had a relationship with God, and God was with them. God demonstrated his faithfulness through his presence with them. Uh, I want to look through here... Uh, Let's go to the next chapter here, chapter 4. 
God's presence in our life makes a big difference. Amen? Makes a big difference. If we went through life alone, probably none of us would make it. Um, but the fact that God is with us, we can keep moving. No matter how rough the going gets, we're able to move forward because God is with us. Amen? In chapter 4, verse 1, Moses answered and said, but suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. Suppose they say the Lord has not appeared to you. So once again we see that Moses is having uh, some doubt. He's having a uh, doubt about being accepted by the people. And so God says to him, here's three things I, I, I'm going to prove that I'm with you. And he tells Moses to take this staff. He has this rod in his hand. He says, take this staff, throw it on the ground. And so Moses throws this rod on the ground. It becomes a snake. And then God says, pick it up. So Moses picks it up and it becomes a rod again. So it's really a miraculous sign. And then Moses said, yeah, but they still might not believe me. And God says, put your hand inside your, your, your robe. And Moses sticks his hand inside, and when he pulls his hand out, his hand is leprous. And, and so he's kind of scared. And God says, now stick your hand back in. And he sticks it back in, and when he pulls it out, he's whole again. And so then God says, here's a third sign if they still won't believe. And God tells him to take a, a bowl of water out of the river and to pour it onto the ground. So Moses does that, and when he pours the water onto the ground, it pours out like blood. It looks like blood. And so these three signs are something that God gives to Moses to demonstrate to the people as proof that he has met with God. But Moses still has doubt. And that's what we see here in chapter 4, verse 1. Moses answered and said, But suppose they will not believe me or listen to my voice. And then in verse 10, we see that doubt surface again. Then Moses said to the Lord, O oh my Lord, I am not eloquent. Neither before nor since. You have spoken to your servant, but I am slow of speech and slow of tongue. <laughs> so Moses, he's thinking of every excuse in the book of why he should not go to Pharaoh. Why he should not go to the children of Israel and be their deliverer. We're kind of like that at times. I think we see everything as, as an obstacle and, and an impossibility, but we're not trusting in God. And so if we can begin to focus on God and his faithfulness, I think these obstacles shrink down. And so the Lord said to Moses in verse 11, Who has made man's mouth? Or who makes the mute, the deaf, the seeing, or the blind? Have not I, the Lord? Now therefore go, and I will be with your mouth and teach you what you shall say. <laughs> so let's just pause for a moment and, and let's reread that. Go, and I will be with your mouth. i got to write it down. Because it's, it kind of sounds odd, but there's really something there. Go, and I will be with your mouth. Now, what we see here, it's a command. Go. God is telling Moses to go. He's giving him some direction. Just like God gave Abraham direction. He told him to leave his house and to, to move on. And now he's telling Moses, go. Do this thing that I've asked you to do. And I will be with your mouth. Earlier, we discovered that God revealed to Moses, I will certainly be with you. Now he's saying, I will be with your mouth. So in other words, those aspects of our life that are less than stellar, those aspects of our life that we see as a deficiency or that we see as something that does not put us in a position to be successful, God can use those things. You see, God can use our weakness. And the way he does that is through his presence. You see, I will be with your mouth. Moses, they think that maybe he stuttered. 
and that he was unable to talk to Pharaoh because he stuttered. But God is saying, I will be with your mouth. You see, God will make up for that deficiency in your life. God will make up for that thing that you see as a distraction or an obstacle because God's faithfully present. Now I want to keep going. Ultimately, we know that Moses followed through on, on God's orders. He took Aaron with him. And there were multiple plagues, right, that God brought upon Pharaoh and upon Egypt because Pharaoh kept refusing to let the Israelites leave. Pharaoh would not let them leave. He wanted to keep them in bondage. He wanted to keep them enslaved there in the land of Egypt. And the last plague, it was the death of the firstborn, remember? And, and, and what, what I discovered as I read some of these passages here, this is in Exodus chapter 12, if you would want to turn there. We're going to go there in just a moment. Is that God makes a distinction between those who are in relationship to him and those who are not in relationship to him. So let's just write this down. Distinction. Distinction. And what that means is that God categorizes people into two categories, at least in the book of Exodus. And we're going to see that this categorization, it, it's true today as well. But it's certainly something that we see in the book of Exodus. So in Exodus chapter 12, verse 5, God gives an order to Moses and to the children of Israel. He tells them to get a lamb. He says, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel shall kill it at twilight, and they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the house where they eat it. So God is basically telling the children of Israel, I want you to sacrifice an innocent lamb, an unblemished lamb. I want you to sacrifice it. And I want you to apply the blood to the door of your dwelling, the place where you live. And there's, there's really a great analogy here. But So the blood, it was something that God could recognize when, when he came through to punish the Egyptians because they were not in relationship. But you see, if you're in relationship with God, you will obey his commands. And this command was to put blood on the left and the right side of the doorpost and then on the top of the doorpost of their dwelling. And so it's the same thing for us, okay? Uh, only we're not killing lambs. You see, God provided the sacrifice in our case. He provided his only son, Jesus. And when God makes a distinction between the believer and the unbeliever, what he's looking for is is the blood of Jesus applied to our dwelling? Is it applied to the entry of our life, the entry of our dwelling? Amen. And so there's, there's really a, a great analogy here. I want to keep going. Verse 12, chapter 12, verse 12 in the book of Exodus. For I will pass through the land of Egypt on that night and will strike all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast. And against all the gods of Egypt, I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. You know, one of these days, God is going to exercise judgment here on planet Earth. Here in the United States of America, God is going to exercise judgment. And he's going to make a distinction between those who are in relationship with him. And between those 
who don't have a relationship. He's going to exercise judgment. And the way God is going to do that, He's going to look for the blood. He's going to look for the blood of Jesus. Here, the blood of Jesus is present in our lives. Here there is no blood. No blood covering. And you see, the significance of the blood is that the blood of Jesus covers our sins. Amen? I just want to turn to 1 John, and I'm, I'm a little bit out of sequence, but that's okay. I just feel led to go to 1 John chapter 1, verse 7. If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his Son, cleanses us from all sin. And I could read multiple scriptures about judgment, about how on judgment day, God is going to separate the righteous from the wicked. He's going to separate them like goats from sheep. And one half... <laughs> is going to go into eternal glory. And the other half is going to go into eternal punishment. And so it's so important that the blood of Jesus is available and present and recognizable in your life. It's important that you have a relationship with the living God so that when he exercises judgment, you're not found guilty. We're going to keep going here. It says in verse 13, Now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. And so we could keep reading through here, and we understand that uh, God exercised judgment on the Egyptians. You see, when uh, the children of Israel left, they left in a hurry, they were told to leave in a hurry. And when they came to the Red Sea, Pharaoh decided he was mad. It says in chapter 14, verse 9, that Pharaoh mustered up his army and he decided to go after the children of Israel. He wanted to kill them. He wanted to bring them back into bondage and back into slavery. So the Egyptians pursued them, all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh, his horsemen and his army. And he overtook them camping by the sea, beside Pi Heroth before Baal Zephon. And when Pharaoh drew near, the children of Israel lifted their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. So they were afraid, and the children of Israel cried out to the Lord. And so we know that this had to be a fearful experience for the children of Israel to see Pharaoh coming after them. Now Pharaoh had lost his firstborn son because God exercised judgment. And now Pharaoh is, is really just angry. Verse 13, Moses said to the people, Do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord for which he will accomplish for you today. For the Egyptians whom you see today, you shall see again no more forever. The Lord will fight for you, and you shall hold your peace. So this is a great uh, promise that Moses is making. It, it's more than a promise. It's a reality. For God to fight on behalf of the children of Israel, he has to be present. And he is. He's present with them. Just like he's present with us. You see, the devil, our enemy, this old flesh, it wants to sin. It wants to pull us back into bondage. It wants to pull us out of relationship and back into bondage to sin. But God is with us. His Holy Spirit is within us. And so we can stand still and see the salvation of the Lord because we are in right relationship with him. And we have the blood of Jesus applied to the doorpost of our heart. Amen. Now, we understand, it says here, uh, in verse 21, it says, Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, 
And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. So the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea on dry ground, and the waters were a wall to them on their right and on their left. And the Egyptians pursued and went after them into the midst of the sea. What a sight that had to be, huh? What a sight to see the, the wall of water. And not only did the wall of water go up on the left and right, the ground was dry. So Israel passed through the sea. Another one of these great obstacles, they passed through with confidence because by now they are seeing God's deliverance. And there's not a whole lot of doubt. There's a lot of faith now. Now it came to pass in the morning watch that the Lord looked down upon the army of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and cloud. And he troubled the army of the Egyptians. And he took off their chariot wheels. And basically, God caused the waters to come back upon the Egyptians. Now what I want to note is that, I want to go back to verse 20. It says, it came, it says, the angel of God who went before the camp of Israel. Once again, this is a demonstration of God's faithfulness by being present. It says, the angel of God went before the camp of Israel, moved and went behind them, and the pillar of cloud went from before them and stood behind them. And it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. So once again, we see God is making the distinction between the Egyptians and the Israelites. It says, thus it was a cloud and darkness to the one, to the Egyptians, but it gave light by night to the other, to the Israelites, so that the one did not come near the other all that night. You see, this is another demonstration of God's faithfulness. He is able to stand before you and your enemy. He's able to be present and give you light. And at the same time, he's present, but those who are out of relationship with them, with him, they experience darkness. And so today, we're going to conclude uh, this conversation by saying, uh, God is faithfully present in the life of the believer. And he's faithfully present in our world. And what it takes, it takes a relationship with God to experience his presence. It takes a relationship with God to experience his faithfulness. And there's multiple aspects to God's faithfulness. We're going to look at several over the next few weeks, several aspects of God's faithfulness. This is just such a powerful attribute. We can't just cover it in one week. We have to take multiple weeks to explore it and understand it. So right now we understand that God's faithfulness is a process. It's not a one-time experience. It's not a step. It's a process. We experience through life, especially in our relationship with God. And number two, or I shouldn't say number two, but Part of that process of faithfulness is God's presence. God is faithfully present in the life of the believer. Let's close in a word of prayer. Lord, today we are thankful that you are faithfully present in our lives. God, that when we go through the waters, you'll make a way. God, that when we're being pursued by the enemy, that you'll make a way. Lord, when we feel that there's some deficiency or debilitation with our person, some handicap, Lord, you make a way. And you make a way because you are present. You are with us. You are certainly with us, as we discovered in, in this evaluation of the children of Israel, God. As they formed a relationship with you, they experienced your faithfulness through your presence with them. And God, today it's possible that there's people who are listening and maybe watching, and they, they're having doubts. They're going through a tough patch. And, and like Moses, maybe they're having some doubt about what you're calling them to do. And God, I would just ask that you would encourage them. And Lord, that as they partner with you, as they are in relationship with you, that you would open their eyes to see your presence in their life. And that they would experience your faithfulness, Lord. And that as they trust and obey, God, that that relationship they have with you would grow. And that as it would grow, 
that your presence would be more revealed to them so that there would be no doubt that you are with them. Lord, we also understand, God, that it's so important that the blood of Jesus covers us. Lord, that the blood of Jesus is in our lives and over our the entry to our hearts and the entry to our dwellings, Lord, that the blood of Jesus be applied to our hearts today. Because the blood of Jesus is what takes away the sin. It's what takes away the, the punishment that's to come. And Lord, we know that one of these days you're going to execute judgment. And Lord, we don't want to experience the wrath of God. We don't want to be sent to hell. We don't want to experience punishment. But God, we pray that the blood of Jesus would be applied to every area of our life. Lord, our thought life, our action life. Lord, that we would be in faithful service to you, God, so that when you return, that we might be found faithful. Lord, today we give you the praise and the glory. We ask you to be with each one as they go through the day and that they might experience your faithfulness in a new and fresh way. We ask these things in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. God bless you.